Good evening and welcome to this Good Friday service. I want to let you know as Holy Week nears a close that on Sunday, Sunday morning here at Pax Pres, we will have two Easter services at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock with coffee hour and an Easter egg hunt for the children in between. And tonight our nursery is open for children uh, ages four and under if you need that. Tonight's Good Friday service truly is an ecumenical effort. We are blessed to have with us here at Pax Press tonight, Pastor Anna Schwartz, our music director, Aaron Tennyson, and the Lexington Park United Methodist Choir as well. So welcome to all of you. We're glad you're here. And I want to extend a welcome on behalf of this entire church to any of you who are visiting with us from Lexington Park Methodist this evening. A personal note that on the cover of your bulletin, the artwork this evening is provided by one of our own members at Pax Prez, Victoria Godfrey. The name Good Friday comes from a specific use of the word good. There was a time when good meant more specifically holy or pious. And so as an acknowledgement of that perfect, sinless sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, today is in fact holy or good Friday. Tonight we worship God through prayer and through music at the foot of the cross. Just to note that all scripture readings tonight that you'll see on the screen come from the English Standard Version, the ESV. At the conclusion of this worship service, after a very extended period of silence and a ringing bell that will indicate, indicate the end of our worship service, uh, give a moment for the, just enough lights to come back up for safety, and then please plan to depart in silence out of reverence for Christ's sacrifice and atoning death for us on the cross. <clears throat> As you can read in your bulletin, this tenebrae service, this service of shadows, acquired its name organically. In the old cathedrals a millennium ago, of course, there was no electricity. As each candle was blown out successively, new shadows would emerge throughout the evening until the shadows would finally overtake the congregation, leaving them in complete darkness. The definition of liturgy literally means of the people or participation with the people. And so there will be moments throughout the service tonight where you as a congregation will be participating. Now don't worry, we will guide you through those times. Because of the solemnity of this service, there is typically no applause after the musical selections or readings. We are walking on holy ground tonight. The service is divided into five different shadows this evening. After each shadow, we will blow out a candle. The final candle to be snuffed out tonight is the Christ candle. And in fact, that Christ candle is the final Advent candle to be lit on Christmas morning, symbolizing Christ's birth. When the final Christ candle is extinguished, we will collectively sit in darkness for several minutes before the service ends. The darkness represents the darkness that came over the earth when Christ died. It also represents the darkness of sin and of despair, both in biblical times and in our world today. Sitting in darkness is how the service will end tonight. There will be no closing music, no prayer, no benediction, no dismissal. Our service will feel incomplete. It will be incomplete because our story is incomplete. The story will not be complete until Easter morning when believers all across the world have their greatest celebration of all. Corporately sitting in the dark is not something that we typically do. It may seem or feel awkward or perhaps even uncomfortable. And if it does, that's okay. 
because the whole point of the Lenten season is our willingness to give up even small comforts to remind ourselves of the greater sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Sometimes we are tempted to look away, to avert our gaze from ugly things. But today, rather than look away, we want to look at the ugly parts of this story to understand the significance of our redemption. And so now we enter into our first shadow, the shadow of loneliness in the garden. The shadow of loneliness. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners.
the shadow of desertion. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted, deserted him and fled. Either in body or in spirit, please rise as we sing. The shadow of accusation and denial. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, 
where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You were also with Jesus of Galilee, she said but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again and with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Each of us can relate to Peter. While it's easy to self-righteously berate this Christ follower for walking away in fear, have we not all failed? Have there not been times when each of us have fallen in weakness rather than stand in Christ's strength? Romans 7 acknowledges this common human weakness. It says, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. But scripture also tells us that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we are going to do that tonight. We will read a prayer of confession together, which will be on the screen. And I will start the prayer and then you, the congregation, will join on the words in bold. I will lead us at a slow pace so that our hearts can absorb the words that we are saying. So join me in prayer. When we act as though your gospel does not have the power to change us. Forgive us, Lord. When we are consumed by Satan's lies, even though your truth has set us free. Forgive us, Lord for desiring status and power, and yet failing to be your servant, for being so quick to accept your grace. But then you so slow to extend it to those who have hurt us. Forgive us, Lord. For the times when you ran toward us with arms extended. But when we treated you like a stranger, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for losing hope in your goodness. For the smallness of our faith. Forgive us for the sins we know and remember. These sins weigh heavily upon us. And forgive us for the sins which we have forgotten, which meant almost nothing to us, 
but it cost you so dearly. In this solemn hour, as we remember your death, we ask you to pray open all places that are harmed within us. Every place that is self-satisfied and self-serving, every attitude that is superior and smug. We come before you, Lord, asking you to forgive us for loving you so little. We are guilty. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. Nehemiah 9.17 says, But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love.
the shadow of humiliation and crucifixion. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. <clears throat> and they led him out to crucify him. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Again, either in body or in spirit, please rise. <clears throat>
Have you ever been down, sad, depressed, hurt, hopeless, or lonely, and one of the things that you reach for to find some comfort is to watch a sad movie or to listen to sad music? It's, there's something to be said for that saying, misery loves company. Like in the movie Love Actually, when one character finds out that her husband has been cheating on her with another woman, she comforts herself by listening to a sad Joni Mitchell song. I've had an occasion or two where I'm down or sad enough that I want to rewatch Pixar's movie Inside Out. Pixar movies have a tendency to make me a little weepy. That's the one that has always made me cry the most inside out. But more importantly, why do some of us, when we're sad, down, lonely, despairing, sometimes we reach for sad things to comfort us? There's simply something, something simply and strangely comforting about it. I point out that very human experience because on Sundays here at Pax Press, we've been studying through each line of the Apostles' Creed since January. The Apostles' Creed summarizes God's amazing true story fulfilled in Christ. It's a source of strength, a source of power, a source of joy and hope. And then we come to this line. He descended into hell. He descended into hell. That doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? What comfort and good news could there possibly be in knowing that our Savior and Lord, this dreary line, that he descended into hell? So I want to take just a few minutes on this Good Friday to reflect on this fitting line for today in our creed so that we can triumphantly land on the note of resurrection in two days from now. To do this, just as we were listening to the music now, I was imagining the human experience we've seen in movies and hear people say about when your life flashes before your eyes. And I want to share with you a story not from Jesus' passion, his holy week, but maybe something that he was reminded of on that first Good Friday, a conversation with the Pharisees and teachers of the law in Matthew chapter 12. Listen closely to God's word for all of us. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. In that conversation, Jesus says, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is one of the many ways that Jesus describes his death with the analogy of Jonah, the time between his crucifixion and his resurrection. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, and then if you jump a bit, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Now, we can't be 100% sure what exactly the original creed writers meant by this line, partly because before the year 650 AD, the line only appears in one still existing copy of the creed. But it still points us to the comfort of Christ's crucifixion on this Good Friday. There are whole books on this topic, and if you're interested in more, I can point you to them. But for tonight's purposes, I want to briefly summarize a few options from over the centuries of what we're supposed to make of this line when we say it together. I'm going to go briefly between, or from what seems like to me the least likely meaning of he descended into hell to the most likely meaning. First, some say that hell, in this instance, he descended into hell, is the place of eternal torment that we English speakers associate with that word, hell. 
In that reading and belief, in other words, whatever that physical, biblical metaphor of fire means in a spiritual reality, some would say that this means Jesus actually suffered in the fires of hell on that first Holy Saturday until rising again. However, I find that this is not accurate or helpful. Because in Luke 23, we, we know these treasured, famous words where Jesus tells a criminal on the cross beside him that today you will be with me in paradise. Not after Jesus goes to hell and suffers, but today, now. That is just one uh, shadow of the good news of the gospel. Now secondly, some churches who recite the Apostles' Creed just don't say he descended into hell. Or I've known personally individuals who worship at a church that includes that line, but they stay quiet at that point in the reciting the creed. And I very much respect that. That's fine, since biblically speaking, we remain uncertain exactly what it meant. But for 1,300 years and maybe more, Christians across many cultures have said it. So if we are going to leave this line by the side of the road from the creed, we should be slow to do so, only leaving it out for a very good or deliberate reason. Third, some people say he descended into hell and believe that it refers not to literal hell in the sense of the place of eternal torment away from God's presence. What they read in that is that in the Old and New Testament, Hades in Greek and Sheol in Hebrew were words simply for the place where those who are deceased reside. That was distinct from the Greek word Gehenna that we call hell, that place of active eternal separation from God's presence. And so in other words, instead of saying he descended into hell, some people will actually not just believe but say he descended to the dead. He descended to the dead. Now, there are examples of that viewpoint from the 4th century, the 17th century, and the present day. Like a present-day author, Matthew Emerson gives us a word of comfort from that reading. He says that Christ's descent pushes us to recognize that Jesus doesn't simply know what it's like to die. He knows what it's like to be dead, to live in that unnatural state of unclothedness from the body and to dwell among the departed saints. Jesus doesn't just know what it's like to die. He knows what it's like to be dead. There's comfort in that. Now, the pushback against that view is that it comes slightly out of order in the creed after dead and buried. And plus, the creed says, dead and buried, and if he descended into hell simply means he descended to the dead, why would we repeat what we've already said, that he is dead and buried? A creed like this one is meant to be an essential summary of the Christian faith, and it wouldn't be a great summary if it had that redundancy in it. And so the final of option of how we can understand he descended into hell and take strange comfort from it is this. John Calvin once wrote that in descending, descending to hell on, on the cross on Good Friday, Christ bore the weight of divine severity since Isaiah says he was stricken and afflicted by God's hands and experienced all the signs of a wrathful and avenging God. Another author says on the cross that Jesus felt the weight of divine vengeance. Certainly no abyss can be imagined more dreadful than to feel that you are abandoned and forsaken of God. John Calvin says that on the cross, Jesus descended into hell in the sense that Jesus wrestled hand to hand with the devil's power, with the dread of death, with the pains of hell, and so he was victorious and triumphed over all of them. And so it is as if he suffered hell on our behalf. Now I started by saying that the creed is meant to be a source of comfort, strength, and joy. So how could it possibly be a source of comfort and joy to dwell so heavily on Jesus descending into hell? 
We'd all admit that's not a very happy thought, but here's how it helps. If you are ever in one of those down states of being that you think about comforting yourself with sad movies, sad music, sad books, like I suggested a few minutes ago, then here's a more effective strategy of finding strange comfort than any of those things. What I've realized looking at this this past week is that instead of reaching for a copy of Inside Out or a Joni Mitchell record, I should go to Christ. I should go to Christ. Yes, the Christ who rose from the dead on Easter, but also the Christ who descended into hell as part of how he achieved my and your salvation. Author Matthew Emerson says that our high priest understands us better than we think. And when we or our loved ones stand on the brink of death, literally or figuratively, we can draw comfort from knowing that our Savior has already been there. He's already walked through the gates of Hades and come back out with the keys. Another author, Kevin DeYoung, says, it should be a comfort to us in our torment that we go through in this life, that there is no hell we can face greater than the one Christ endured that there is no one better to sympathize with our hellish moments than Christ, and that there is no one else able to save us from the wrath of God than he who has faced it already. So the next time you are in need of that strange comfort that misery loves company, turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. His descent into hell on the cross for us is the greatest possible news God can give in the midst of the darkness and shadows of life. Let's continue to be embraced by that strangely comforting good news as we continue to snuff out the candles and worship God in song and in prayer.
At the end of a tenebrae service, you will hear a loud noise, which is called a strepitus. This loud noise symbolizes the earthquake when the veil, the curtain of the temple, was torn and Jesus took his final breath. This tearing of the curtain is significant because from that point on, all of humankind was given direct access to God. We no longer need a human intercessor on our behalf. The New Testament tells us that there is now one mediator between God and humankind, and that is Christ Jesus. After the strepitus, we will honor Christ's request for his followers to stay and pray with him in this hour of darkness. Excuse me. During this time of darkness, it is appropriate to reflect on Christ's sacrifice to pr and to pray. At the end of three minutes of darkness, which symbolize three days in the grave, a handbell would, will ring and dim house lights will come up, indicating the end of this service. At this point, you may quietly leave the room. However, you are also free to stay and pray as long as you wish. We may be tempted to rush these three minutes of silent darkness, yet the eternal significance of these few moments keeps our impatience in check. May we discipline our hearts into gratefulness and contrition during this time. Historically, as believers would leave the Tenebrae service, they would remain in complete silence, not speaking for the rest of the evening, even in their own homes, out of reverence and brokenness over what they had just experienced. Of course, we will not ask you to keep silent after you leave and go to your own homes, but we will ask you to exit this building in silence rather than in fellowship with other congregants. For the past 1,200 years, Christ followers have gathered on this night to sit with Jesus in his darkest hour, and we are joining generations of saints and believers tonight, and so now we enter the shadow of death. The shadow of death. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Lights go out and candles dim, we grieve a darkened world. Kneeling down before you, sometimes praying without words, longing for redemption's plan to finally be unfurled. We sit in 
in silence wait in hope until you save the world stay with me we hear you ask stay with me Lights go out and candles dim. We recognize our part. The chilly darkness in the world comes from our darkened hearts. We long for light and heaven's warmth, for music to be heard. But we sit in silence, wait in hope until you save the world stay with me we hear you ask stay with me Lights go out and candles dim with tears our vision blurred we sit in silence wait in hope until until you save the world. 